What's up guys? Welcome back to this episode of Design Time where I'm just gonna go over everything that I've made over the last week or so. I did a lot of things, weekends and during the week. First thing was we have a 370 here from uh, one of our drivers, Jonathan Poquin. That's how you say it. We needed to make some seat brackets for them. In the 370, we were dealing with a couple problems that make designing them challenging. So I 3D scanned one of our seats a long time ago. It kind of fits generically what most seats have, which is the spacing on the side mount plus like the proximity and width is roughly the same as everything else. So it was a good starting point. The issue was when we scanned the floor, um, you can see all the different angles and planes so not a single foot of the bracket is actually at the same as the other, which if you look at like a BMW E46 or something, it's just a square all on the same plane, four M10 bolts, 370, not at all the same. So we had to get real creative. This is the second rendition. I made a prototype, we test fitted it, and then I made a couple changes and this is the result. So these are all of the locations available. Now I actually did sit in the seat and tested the majority of these and then we got a shorter person to test the max of forward and the min i guess the max back and max forward so uh, i did the courtesy of kind of labeling it left out and left in because they're only going to fit one way but just to make it that much easier i also realized the seat is completely off center from the chassis itself and that's kind of using the steering wheel and other parts of the car to center the seat in line with the wheel. The first thing I did was assume that the brackets on the floor were centered with the steering wheel. Bad assumption. So when I went into the car, my first set of brackets kind of had these slots centered. Anyways, we were able to come up with something that fits really well, gets the seat nice and tight to the tunnel, centers it, and then allows for a width range of 40 millimeters to be wider or narrower than this. And you can kind of see how they line up with the studs here, here, and on the back of the carpet. And relatively easy to install. Uh, most people are not gonna be running the seat in the maximum low position, so that's no problem. And that was a fun little project. Uh, surprisingly more difficult than building like a control arm or something. Uh, on the next task, which was a cool one, taking a play out of the Porsche playbook on how racing products should be shim adjusted not just porsche um, mclaren ferrari the corvettes a lot of these cars lamborghinis they use either a heim stud style um, or a uniball stud style or something where you're shimming to adjust for your camber um, lots of higher end race cars use this either on the knuckle side or on the chassis side and when we make products for drifting. Uh, notoriously, we found that Heim joints are significantly faster, significantly better because of how high uh, impact drifting is with other cars or with walls or whatever. And you need to be able to have something fail, bend, break, or be replaced easily. Whereas in racing, we're going for a lightweight. You're wrenching on it minimally. Like So at a track, I'm changing my alignment so often due to the bank, due to this, due to that, tire wear, all of that. Whereas a race car, road race car, you're generically setting it up with very small changes. Um, and you're making the car faster and faster. In between tracks, you're gonna be doing some minor changes, but especially when a car gets downforce and extremely stiff springs and everything. On the suspension side of things, you're not really changing much. So the shim style adjustment is what um, I came up with. And using a very generic uniball block that will have two versions. We're gonna have studs in the vertical orientation or studs in the horizontal orientation. A couple people have already commented on um, specifics on how strong is this gonna be when loaded in the vertical orientation like you see on this arm. And it's a good question because there's a huge difference between those two orientations. This particular control arm has a shock uh, load here so we have vertical loads going through this arm. I'm gonna use real simple terms so that you can explain or that you can understand what I'm saying. Um, and then it has basically uh, an in and out force on this. The arm that controls the rotation and other forces of the rear knuckle of this car are the upper A arm is gonna take most of the loads going this way. So this arm has no forces acting on the studs in this direction. All the forces are this way and then in and out. 
So this is a perfect orientation for this block to handle the loads of this control arm. And we're gonna find that this is a significantly stronger, lighter weight and easier to adjust setup for, uh, this is actually for a BRZ. This was the original prototype, which fit really nicely. I then went in a little step further, spent a little more time on it and created a few more options for the coilover. I actually just took the OEM CAD, uh, plotted all the positions that the coilover would go to so I can increase the motion ratio all at the same arc. So we're not gonna be dealing with any um, ride height changes. And then the same thing on the sway bar, the sway bar link is approximately here. And I plotted all of the points that it would be lining up with on the control arm so that we're not changing the height relative. What, what I would be curious on is if we're using an OEM link and I wanna make one side stiffer versus the other, I wouldn't actually be loading up something um, differently because I've plotted the holes. If I just did the holes straight across like I did on the prototype, um, I would actually have to pull the bar down to get into the next hole. So this is just that little bit of effort um, that goes a long way. I also checked for clearance on using a socket, the shim stack, the studs on this are actually just mock-up studs. They're the only ones we had. We will be installing longer ones, um, but essentially these are gonna be coming with a kit of shims like this with varying thicknesses and we'll be able to install them uh, pretty easily on the car while being able to fit the tool required to tighten everything up. So that's something that we've also applied to now. I think I've done it to like six different um, components so far. Uh, one of the ones being the front upper control arms of a Cadillac, which I'll open up for you just to show you. So on a CTS V2, we have some customers requiring some additional adjustment. So what better way to put these into use other than on the front upper of a Cadillac? Uh, so again, we get to see that I have multiple different thicknesses of shims stacked up here. The method of building the arms, we're gonna to get to be creative with. Uh, basically, because this arm is thicker, it had a bit of interference with the nut flange. So we just, in, I added a cutout here, plug welded on the back, three welds on each side of the leg, and we're gonna have a bunch of weld strength there as well as clearance for the socket and the nuts, and I'll be able to stack the shims. With this, we can do caster, we can do uh, camber, and this is gonna be a really easy arm to adjust. On another project that I was working on, we have the BRZ GR86 front lower racing arm. Once again, the only available racing arms on the mar market actually load the control arm incorrectly. And the design of the control arm needed to be a one piece control arm because we have all of our tension forces being applied at this point here. And whenever we hit the brakes super hard, the arm's gonna rotate, it's gonna apply an inward force on our subframe mount here, and everything is happy. But when we make this into a two-piece control arm with a tension rod and then a control arm, we've created a fulcrum. We have tension here, I apply the brakes here, and then it actually acts as a lever, and it applies a force on the subframe in this direction. And the subframe wasn't necessarily designed to handle that, so, the way that this is designed is going to be way better for racing. Um, drifting, again, is a bit different. So when we talk about racing stuff, we need to design things around minimal weight, uh, maximum strength, rigidity, stiffness, all of that has to come into play, as well as we cannot have anything coming loose. Some of these cars are on the track for four hours stints at a time doing endurance races and stuff. So once again, we have a shim adjusted point at the control arm or the lower control arm position. And then this was really interesting that I had to come up with. Uh, to adjust caster, basically we have multiple positions that this is gonna line up with in three different slots. And we have, uh, it's like over 16 positions, all varying degrees of adjustment where these holes will line up with uh, the holes on the arm. And the reason I had to do that is because the BRZ has a tow hook here it's got some sheet metal here and there's literally no room to put any form of adjustment on this. So this is what we had to come up with. And once again, this is not going to be coming loose or having any issues. Matching the ball joint angle and everything was done as well. And then we're making this a stackable washers 
to stack on the stud against the bottom of the knuckle, which will be increasing or decreasing the roll center of the car. That was one of the design requirements asked to, to us by some guys that race these, these cars. Another thing we're working on is uh, E90, E80, and G42 body BMW stuff. My friend over in Latvia, Maurice, uh, he owns Drift Armnika. You guys probably know him from helping me in Drift Masters. He actually, we did the alignment at his shop and everything else. He's been really great, uh, great friend, talking with him and working with him on some different projects. We did a B46 quick change mount where I designed some plates, sent it over to him. He got it laser cut locally. Now he's scanning some things and sending those over to me. This is actually a G42 scan that he sent over. So I've got the wheel bearing, I've got the knuckle, and I just overlaid it with our prototype E90, E80, E90 knuckle. Um, he wants to use an E90 wheel bearing so we can see that we have differences on the brake mounting points, we have differences on the brake offset, but otherwise we're relatively there. We have to move the strut over just a little bit, but we're actually pretty much there. We only need to make a couple small changes. Our strut angle and everything is already perfect and our Ackerman shim adjustable knuckle is going to work well. Our lead and trail bump stops, I got to make a couple small adjustments to the control arm and then this is actually going to work out quite nicely. So we're, what's basically going to happen is I'm going to send over these parts. Ideally he will help us with getting the FDF race shop Europe division rolling and uh, eventually going back there for some Driftmaster stuff in the future will also be easier if we're working with somebody like him. So that's uh, in the near future, I'm sure, next couple years, let's say. Last thing I'm gonna talk about, go over quickly, was a racing version of a 370Z um, control arm. We have the original here. Kind of see the shadow of it there. And this is a pretty big requirement because the factory arm has the ball joint integrated with the control arm and these control arms are very expensive and if your ball joint goes bad you have to get rid of the control arm. So we're making a serviceable racing control arm once again using these shims. And remember when I talked about we have horizontal or vertical adjustments here but you can notice that I added this hole. And the reason I added this hole was for cases like this where we have a control arm that has a lot of force applied vertically because the shock mounts to it plus it has a lot of force applied horizontally so this is what this third point is actually for and it allows us to still have adjustment but we're going to capture this block um, in a very structural way so that we are controlling those forces and then on this side our forces are in this direction because we have a one-piece control arm it's rotating and we're actually going to be able to adjust um, our caster and our camera using this block that bolts to the subframe. So if you know 370s, you can see how this is gonna work and uh, you're gonna see some more stuff on the builder side of things on the website, including these, which I didn't talk about, but I'm gonna cover really quickly. We spent a bunch of money on making press-in studs that go inside of our heim joints and maintaining tolerances on really hard materials. Pressing into something means you're working with tenths of a thou, and that made it really difficult to get consistent press fits so we decided let's design an integrated t-bar style heim joint where the bearing is actually part of the stud forget the pressing if you accounted for labor this is cheaper for us to do but this also has a lot of universal possibilities for guys building anything kit cars road cars or whatever you can basically just make these holes on your chassis and you can put this on and any control arm that bolts to this, you can have your adjustment either with the thread on the heim joint or with the stud off the chassis. That's a lot of stuff. Basically when Joel was gone, we took a week off of working on stuff in the shop. I just went crazy on designing things, which I love to do. There's gonna be more things to update you on next week as we get to testing some of these products. Um, a lot of these I've sent the files to Rain to cut, but that's basically all I have to cover. We have one other cool thing. Alex has put together a pretty sweet jig table setup. After building the first one, we made a bunch of changes and did some things. He's gonna talk about it, it's pretty cool. So as Josiah mentioned, I was asked to build a uh, parametric jig table so we can start providing some as like a DIY solution to people online. Uh, so what I was asked to do was create a table that could be adjusted by length and width. Um, easily so you didn't have to go through and design a whole new table if you wanted like a 3x7 or a 4x8 you could just go into your parameters and you can just change these two expressions and then that would 
move your table, for example. It takes a while and the computer kind of hates it, but it's a lot easier in the long run if you do it like this for you. And basically all it's doing is it's just these two dimensions are referenced by everything else and everything else works off these two dimensions to give you a spacing, a whole amount, a length, a width, and all that kind of jazz. You can actually see the smoke come out of the computer once you start doing this. So the nice part about having all this like this too is if somebody wanted to get, say have like half inch holes, I could just come in and I could change one of the parameters to 0.5 and then this table that they wanted would have half inch holes everywhere. If they wanted a one inch spacing, I could do one inch spacing. It's really nice in the back end to have stuff all geometrically constrained because it makes your life easier and simpler and faster basically. So what we went ahead and did also is make a bunch of locating parts for the table. This would just be like your common stuff that you see on most websites like Fireball Tool and all that. Just common stuff that you'd be able to either buy from us or cut or make yourself. We're gonna provide all that. So we're basically trying to offer a bunch of different sizes for this as well. So we just have common sizes right now laid out, but like I said earlier with the um, everything being parametric, if somebody did order a three by seven or anything like that, it's nothing for us to just go back into the master file, you could call it, and make a three by seven table for them. And we would also offer shipping of the components, or if somebody wanted to, they could just purchase the DXF files from us and they could do it all themselves. We'll see you next week for something. I'm gonna be really busy. We got DMCC on Friday. I'm going to Drift Colorado, which is a Pro-Am 265 tire thing. I'm driving my old S14 with uh, James Dunn. So that's it, we'll see you guys next week. There's gonna be lots of things to uh, film. So lots of things to watch.